Tough questions tonight about a county leader accused of using a children's charity to finance his world travel. County commissioners question whether he's using the good works for his own gain. I see no conflict of interest. He may not see a conflict, but some of his fellow commissioners do. Good evening, I'm Guy Rawlings. And I'm Stephanie Fisher. Fulton County Chairman John Eaves is accused of soliciting money for his charity from businesses who have county contracts. And some commissioners question whether Eaves is getting a kickback in this deal. Our chief investigative reporter, Wendy Saltzman, has the exclusive story. The trip spanned the globe from South Africa to Germany, Turkey, China, and Brazil. Eve says he created the program to give kids international awareness, but his opponents question if he's just funneling money from prohibited county contractors to pay for his own personal holidays. Public office not for sale. Buy it, sell it, go to jail. County Commissioner Emma Darnell launched an attack at Fulton County Chairman John Eaves. If employees and officers want to go on a trip, uh, you have to pay your own way. What got her fired up is a program called Fulton County Global created by the chairman to take kids abroad. This county program is funded dollar by dollar by businesses who are vying for valuable contracts with the county. And some of the criticism here is that you're funneling money through the county for your own personal trips abroad. Let me tell you, that that is absolutely untrue. Chairman Eve says the program has been awarded national accolades and who better to travel on these trips but the chairman himself. Eves personally decides the location of the trips and he also helps secure their funding. Are there Fulton County contractors that are then being asked for donations for this program? Well, I mean, you know, again, there, 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 there are some folks who have done some business with the county, but there has not been any sort of violation of whatever the rules, regulations that are in place. The issue was supposed to be heard at this week's board meeting, but Eves pulled the item off the agenda when CBS Atlanta News started sniffing around. You can tell us why you're withholding. We held it at the last week. I chose not to withhold. I chose to hold it. That's the reason why. I see no conflict of interest. Okay, you see no conflict of taking money from county contractors. No. You're not giving them favors no, with response for the without, favor they've without, given you? Without no, ex absolutely nothing. Eves and five other county employees were recently reimbursed $9,600 for a trip with no documentation. And according to this internal memo, travel outside of the U.S. is not allowable under the county's policy. We got to maintain the integrity. We don't want anybody out there watching this program to think the way I get a contract from Fulton County is I got to pay somebody's travel. Commissioners have now passed a bill listing funds from county contractors to pay for their trips. No word yet on how that will affect the Global Youth Program. I'm Wendy Saltzman, CBS Atlanta News. A CBS Atlanta investigation reveals the FBI is looking for the person who leaked sensitive information about its two-year probe into the outlaw motorcycle gang in Georgia and put agents in danger. Court documents reveal that leak came from a law enforcement officer. The FBI had to pull its undercover agent and two confidential informants after the identity of one of them was blown. A former federal prosecutor says leaks like this put lives at risk. The risk is death. I mean, you could have an undercover uh, who's, um, in this case, in a motorcycle gang riding along with a gang, and, and that person could be killed. After the leak, the FBI raided the outlaws earlier than it had planned to. Agents arrested 23 of them for drug and gun offenses. Now, the FBI believes its confidential informant could be in serious danger, so it moved him and his family to another state. Tough questions tonight for the city of Atlanta after some homeowners caught city workers illegally dumping waste on private property. This video shows workers dumping concrete, cones, and stakes after fixing a storm drain on Lucy Street. Soon after CBS Atlanta News began investigating, workers returned to the neighborhood to clean up the mess and even fix a street sign that was knocked down. CBS Atlanta's Adam Murphy had tough questions for the workers who admitted they dumped the trash. You guys said you did it, but you're saying there's nothing wrong with what you did. I'm not saying that it's not wrong what we did. If my crew did, did it illegally, and is thinking um, whatever's over there, they're here to clean it up now. 
CBS Atlanta News received a statement from the city which says, in part, it is a clear violation of the city code and the matter has been turned over to the Atlanta Police Department for investigation. The city goes on to say appropriate disciplinary action will be taken against the involved parties. We just learned new details about an ultralight plane that crashed into a tree along Shady Grove Road in Cumming. Witnesses say the pilot took off from a yard this afternoon and then right after takeoff, a gust of wind sent him right into that tree. Firefighters used a ladder truck to get him down. He wasn't hurt, and his wife told us afterward he just wanted to take a bath and relax. The plane, by the way, is still up there. A CBS Atlanta health alert about tainted medications linked to deadly fungal meningitis infections. We've now learned the tainted steroid was sent to medical facilities in Georgia and 22 other states. Now, 35 people in these states, in these six states in particular, have gotten sick from the medicine made by the New England Compounding Center in Massachusetts. Five people have died. The drug maker has recalled the steroids and shut down production. Now, tomorrow morning's forecast in the first five minutes with Martina Brown. Temperatures were definitely warmer today. Don't you just love it as we get warmer, as we get closer to the weekend? The question, though, is will this warmth stick around for Saturday and Sunday? We'll talk about that coming up, but right now it's nice. From places like Blue Ridge to Peachtree City, where we're in the low 60s, Swanee at 63, Atlanta, 65 degrees is the current temperature. So tomorrow morning, at least it's a good start. We know that, right? We've got 58 degrees, a mainly clear sky, a little on the cool side, but we will not see any rain. The temperatures, though, that will be in the 50s are pretty much going to be widespread. We're looking at 54 degrees to start in Canton, 54 in Lake Lanier, even down in Jonesboro. They'll be in the mid 50s when the average low is actually 58 degrees. So as we talk about your Friday, again, we won't start out wet, but will we end up that way? And what will our afternoon temperatures look like? I'll let you know coming up in just a little bit. Don't forget, start your day with Better Mornings Atlanta. They kick it off at 5 a.m. Back to you. A developing story tonight. Parents accused of abusing their son go before a judge. And in court today, investigators revealed some horrifying details about what they say happened to this boy. CBS Atlanta's Katie Brace joins us live in Paulding County. Katie, the mother's attorney says it's all made up. Well, that's right, guys. She says the alleged abuse is a lie, but the Comers are here in jail tonight. A judge denied them bond over concerns that they might run. And at today's bond hearing, we learned new horrific details about the alleged abuse their son endured and could not escape. Mitch, like I want to go anywhere but that house. I care where they put me. Anywhere but this Paulding County house, detectives say Mitch Comer's mother Sheila and stepfather Paul kept him prisoner for years. He wouldn't get fed very much at all and that he would have to beg for food. Officers say when Mitch turned 18, his stepfather put him on a bus to Los Angeles. That's where investigators found him at a bus station. He weighed 87 pounds and his skin was practically see-through. It's a translucent color. You can see veins throughout his body. Detectives say they then discovered the abuse Mitch had survived. He was locked in the bathroom at one point for over a year, and the bathroom is a uh, probably six by eight bathroom. And when Mitch was allowed to sleep in his bedroom, he was rarely let out to use the bathroom. They made his child sleep on this mattress for at least a year. Nothing else in the room besides his own urine. Sheila Comer's attorney says Mitch is lying and could have left at any time. If you have it, bring it. Show us the chisel marks. Show us the, 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 the spot where he was kicking on the, uh, on the door are scratching on the wall. Investigators testified the Comer's two daughters were malnourished and had not seen Mitch for two years. And according to at least one document, the Comer's did not even acknowledge Mitch existed. On their lease agreement that they only had two children, didn't state a third child. And officers found Mitch Comer three weeks ago. He is now staying with a local family and has gained at least 10 pounds. His two sisters are in state custody. Reporting live in Dallas, Katie Brace, CBS Atlanta News. After only three days of testimony, prosecutors rested their case in a trial of a man accused of killing two DeKalb County police officers. Investigators say William Woodard shot officers Ricky Bryant and Eric Barker multiple times in January 2008. Now, Woodard claims he shot the officers in self-defense after they used unnecessary force on him. He also says the officers who arrested him after the shootings roughed him up as well. The prosecutors put one of those officers on the stand.
Did you see any officer hit the defendant? No, sir. Did you see any officer kick the defendant? No, sir. Did you see any officer make a violent contact with the defendant's testicles? No, sir. Because the state ended its case so soon, the defense was not ready. They'll present their first witnesses on Monday. William Woodard is expected to take the stand in his own defense. Only on CBS Atlanta, it is one of the most memorable stories of loss we've ever reported. Hardy Jackson's wife slipped from his grasp and disappeared into the storm surge of Hurricane Katrina. Now, for the last seven years, he has lived here in Metro Atlanta and has just now received the news he's waited seven years for. He gave me a whole lot of clothes. I uh, dragged my tears up. I uh, eased the pain in my heart. Here, the final promise Hardy made to his wife and why he's determined to keep it even though his health is failing. Plus, beer cans, plastic cups, even an old teddy bear. It's all floating around in your drinking water. Where are all this trash is coming from and why it's so hard to keep it out of the water? You drink. And enjoy these 80s while you can because soon we will have 40s back in the forecast. All the details are coming up. New tonight, police arrest this man for a string of restaurant burglaries. Samuel Mosley is in a Fulton County jail cell. Police say you can clearly see his face in this surveillance video as he's robbing a restaurant in Cherokee County. He was wanted for robbing other businesses in a few other counties, too. A judge has denied him bond. New tonight, it's Atlanta's largest source of fresh water, and it's full of trash, from diapers to discarded oil cans. Parts of the lake are clogged with garbage. Only CBS Atlanta's Mike Paluska got a first-hand look at the problem and looks into where the trash is coming from. Most of Lake Lanier is pristine. There is no trash whatsoever, but there is a dark side of this lake where some people can't even get their boats out of their docks because there is so much debris and they want something done. Solid, Solid trash and wood and whatever this stuff is that floats on the top. Marguerite Jones has a couple weapons of choice to pluck trash out of Lake Lanier, and she's not alone. Her neighbor does the same thing. It's a ritual both do after heavy rains. I've been here for 13 years, and, you know, you pay astronomical property taxes to live on this lake, and then the first thing, you don't have any water, and then you have this. On some days, the trash keeps them from going out on their boat. Uh, last night, there's a floating tire. We can probably still find that for you. Jerry Gould lives just down the way. He gave us a tour of the problem on his boat. It's gross, it's nasty, it's frustrating. Um, even if we did our part and cleaned up our area around our dock and our shoreline of the lake, um, it, it, it's still always going to be there. There are groups and organizations that try to clean out parts of Lake Lanier and parts of the creek that are really bad, but people we spoke to say it is a never-ending battle. Trash keeps reappearing, and unless it stops at the source all the way that way, residents say this problem will never go away. Something needs to happen. Um, and as we've discussed, what needs to happen is, is this is obviously, from our opinion, from what we know, is, is coming from the streets somewhere. Um, from the runoff, from the, the drainage. And obviously the, somebody needs to get together and at the source. But so far, no one has been able to pinpoint that source. Some plastic <laughs> cups, a soccer ball, more like cups. Beer cans. Beer cans. <laughs> Until that happens, residents like Jones will have their gear in hand. Instead of enjoying their million dollar views, they'll be looking at a garbage dump. There's gotta be some solution, you know, that's not an astronomical price tag. Ghoul says he's been dealing with this problem for so many years he is finally taking a stand. He hopes that county and city leaders will come together and finally find a solution for this problem. We're in Hall County. Mike Paluska, CBS Atlanta News. Only on CBS Atlanta tonight. One man's heartache during Hurricane Katrina and his determination to keep a promise to his late wife captured the nation's attention. Hardy Jackson lost his wife to the storm surge. He recalled what happened just hours after the floodwaters receded to our own Jennifer Merrily. And Jen Hardy and his family have called Atlanta home for the mm -hmm. past seven years. Update us on this family. You know, I've kept in touch with Hardy Jackson and his family since Katrina. I followed their ups and downs and their struggles have been mighty. Last summer, Hardy's oldest daughter lost her battle with cancer. And just a year later, as Hardy prepares to say his final goodbye, he received a piece of paper that eased the pain. Seven long years. Woo, no, I thought I'd never see seven years, you know, pass by. 
Hardy Jackson lives in Palmetto, Georgia, along with two of his kids and four grandkids. It's hundreds of miles from Biloxi, Mississippi, the place they used to call home before Hurricane Katrina roared ashore and changed their lives. Well, we did try to leave, but it was too late. The van was doing the sound, floating and stuff, you know. He lets his mind wander back to a happier time, a marriage with Tonette full of life and promise, a love so unwavering, Hardy's heart as full today as the day he lost her. We got up in the roof, all the way to the roof, and, and Walla came and had just, just open up, divided. I tried, I, I, I hold her hand tight I could, and she told me, you can't hold me. She said, take care of the kids and the grandkids. It's a promise that weighs heavily on Hardy's mind, one he kept after losing his oldest daughter, Mary, to cancer last summer. Hardy now raises her two sons. Yeah, I you talk about Mary and Jennifer. You know, they watch one of your kids, you know, fade. They fade away, you know, right in your face, you know. Mr. Jackson, how are you doing? Hardy adjusts to seeing the inside of a doctor's office more and more himself these days. Deep breath, in and out, okay? All righty, let's go. Doctors diagnosed the 60-year-old with stage 4 lung cancer in May. Told him I'm going to die. Exactly what he told me. Maybe a year, maybe six months. Maybe three months. It is so it is a lung cancer which has spread it to the brain. And unfortunately, this is considered a stage four disease, which is incurable. Now facing his own mortality, Hardy received a letter he'd been longing for, his wife's death certificate. Tony's body had been lost to the storm surge. The court order reads, the date of death is hereby established as August 29th, 2005, the date of Hurricane Katrina. It gave me a whole lot. Of I close, I to dry my tears up, I ease the pain in my heart. Hardy says despite surviving what sometimes seems like insurmountable obstacles, when he looks around, he realizes he's been making good on that promise to his wife to take care of the kids and the grandkids. If I go now, at least I did do something right, you know, cause I ain't give up. Mm -mm. I ain't give up, did give up. Hardy tells me he will keep that promise to take care of the kids and the grandkids until his eyes close and his heart stops. He'd like to be remembered as a good dad and a good man. And Stephanie Guy, I still get emails from people all around the world wondering how Hardy is wow. doing, and he wants to thank everyone who has thought of him over the years. I know, and I just, to hear him kind of be at peace mm -hmm. and have that piece of paper from his beloved wife, we just, we wish him the best. Absolutely, seven years later. And thank it still you. seems like he's made, still be, victimized by the hurricane. Do we yeah. know if this, uh, his illness, his cancer and his daughter's cancer are related in any way to the storm? We, we don't, but we do know that right now he has stage four lung cancer mm -hmm. that spread to his brain and uh, he finally got something that he'd been longing for yes. for a long time. We certainly wish him and his family the best, mm -hmm. Jen. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Now, your CBS Atlanta storm tracker forecast with neighborhood weather. We are on our way to another very cool fall night tonight, Metro Atlanta, but Right now, temperatures aren't so bad. We're at 57 degrees in LJ, 59 in Canton, 68 in Atlanta, and 64 in Covington. But before the night is all said and done, everybody, and I mean everybody from top to bottom, will be in the 50s. We're looking at 53 degrees for a low tonight in LJ, 53 in Gainesville, upper 50s in Atlanta, 56 in Griffin, 56 for the folks in Covington, and even off to the west. They, too, will be singing the 50 song. We're doing 53 in Floyd County and 54 in Carrollton. Tomorrow, we're looking pretty good, don't you think? Check out the highs. 83 degrees will be the high. Remember, temperatures were in the low 80s today as well. So we're looking at another gorgeous day, all about the 80s with more sunshine. 81 will be the high in LJ, 81 in Gainesville, 84 for the folks in Eatonton, and 83 in LaGrange. So tomorrow... We've got a big game going on. The Braves are going on, going at the St. Louis Cardinals. Game time right there is 507. We're looking at 83 degrees, mainly sunny and beautiful. Take a look at Futurecast, though, because this is going to show us where things start to change. It's in advance of a front right here Saturday. You can see the clouds start to increase from the northwest and we'll have a slight chance for 
some rain, mainly as we get into Saturday and also as we get into Sunday behind the front. But it's behind the front that you'll really start to notice that something's changed because we'll see really cool temperatures. Again, as we get into the weekend, we're going to start out in the 80s, pretty much like we were today. But before it's all said and done, we're going to be seeing temperatures in the 60s for highs and 40s for lows. So that's what we're doing here. Big changes with our latest model as this front makes its way through. So when we talk about Monday, we're looking mainly sunny and 69 degrees. Again, starting to moderate with those temperatures for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday as they climb slowly but surely into the upper 70s. But as we talk about the weekend here, now we are looking at a slight chance of showers for Saturday and Sunday. So Saturday gets an 8 and Sunday, a seven. That's a look at your forecast. Stephanie and Guy, take it away. Pothole Harry is acting like a big baby tonight, even throwing temper tantrums. Next, why Harry's fit got cut short. Today, Pothole Patrol was ready to declare war. Harry was convinced Clayton County wanted nothing to do with them. Yeah, yesterday, no one responded to his complaints about a road in the Falcon Crest subdivision in Ellenwood. But today was different. Clayton's Department of Transportation, a good place for a little tantrum. I called the public transportation director. He says he can't talk to me. Yes, this morning I was being a baby. We just wanted Clayton to fix a silly little dip. Today I call. He's not in the office. They put me on hold. Let me explain. Over the past couple of years, I've had a rocky relationship with Clayton, at times filling potholes on my own, so I was convinced that I was on the outs. I'm looking for Jeff Matarco. <laughs> then yesterday, we did a silly little bit on the Falcon Crest subdivision in Ellenwood. Yes, we compared the neighborhood to the hit 80s nighttime soap. We just wanted the fix. It's been there for eight years. The real problem was right around the corner on Panola. Just as we pulled up, so did the county. Keith Rowling, assistant director. You ruined my day because I was throwing a temper tantrum, and now you're here. Sorry about that. Turns out Clayton really does want to help with these holes and that dip. You're going to fix it? Yes, sir. Oh, how thrilled we are. Panola and the dip will be patched tomorrow, and soon Falcon Crest will be like new. You look just like Lorenzo Lamas. You got problems with your eyes? And this is who we really have to thank, Mac McMillan, who entered our Pothole Patrol t-shirt contest. You gave us two stories. Here's your shirt. That's all we've got on the Pothole Patrol. Harry Samler, CBS Atlanta News. If you want a Pothole Patrol t-shirt, and we know you do. <laughs> like us on Facebook and upload a picture of a traffic issue. If Harry uses your picture on Pothole Patrol, you win a shirt. You have until next Wednesday. Here's a story that's positively Georgia. Two of Georgia's wounded veterans will receive custom-built homes thanks to Building for America's Bravest. Marine Corporal Todd Love lost his legs and his left hand when he stepped on an IED in Afghanistan. And Michael Schlitz was burned over 85% of his body when his vehicle came under attack in Iraq. These I mean, you know, homes will help the men become more independent. The whole house is going to be made so that everything I do is going to be easier and you know, I'll be able to cook and clean my dishes and really, really be independent and it's going to start giving me a whole new way of life. Actor Gary Sinise and his Lieutenant Dan Band will put on a benefit concert November 3rd at Verizon Wireless Amphitheater to raise money to build these homes. To find out more about the nonprofits involved and where you can buy tickets to the concert, go to CBSAtlanta.com and click on web links. Thanks for making CBS Atlanta your choice for news. It's Friday almost. Letterman's next. We'll see you tomorrow.